Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our keynote panel. First, let me thank the curators and organizers of this year's Biennale for having put together such an amazing and especially timely program and to gather all these prominent thinkers, architects and designers here in Tallinn. My name is Ellen Steiner and I am a curator based in Zurich, Switzerland. As the overarching topic of this Biennale suggests, we need to address our global ecological crisis, not only through our way of living, but especially through the very powerful tools of design and architecture. Our two keynote speakers, Claudia Pasquero and Philip Rahm, both pursue a practice that incorporates the themes that are addressed here in Tallinn very well in their practice. Both understand the design process as holistic practice they consider nature not simply as a backdrop to human activities, but offer ways to create new alliances with the forces of nature. They understand buildings as a means of shaping the spheres and atmospheres that constitute the environments that we inhabit. But most importantly, they deal with the key question, how can the global world be made more habitable? a question especially important for us architects and designers, and a question that will hopefully be widely debated here in Tallinn. Before I hand over to Claudia and Philip so that they can start with their lectures, let me introduce them properly. Claudia Pasquero is an architect, creator, author, and educator. Her work and research operates at the intersection of biology, computation, and design. She is also a co-director of Ecologic Studio in London, which she co-founded in 2005 with her partner Marco Paletto. The studio has built a unique portfolio of biophilic sculptures, living structures and nature-based design solutions to the imminent impact of climate change. In 2018, it joined the Synthetic Landscapes Lab, University of Innsbruck, and the Urban Morphogenesis Lab at Bartlett UCL to create the Photosynthetica Venture. Claudia Pasquero has lectured and taught internationally, for example, at the AA in London, the AAAC in Barcelona, Cornell University, Bartlett, and so on. And she has been the director of fabrication ecologies at the AAAC in Barcelona since October 2012. She was also the head curator of the Tallinn Architecture Biennale a couple of years ago in 2017. Furthermore, she is a co author of Systemic Architecture operating manual for the self-organizing city, published in 2012. Her work has been published and exhibited internationally, for example, at the FRAC Centre in Orléans, the Venice Architecture Biennale, the ZKM Karlsruhe, and the Milano Expo, among others. Currently, she's writing a new book with Marco Paletto, titled Deep Green, Biodesign in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. I'm looking forward to reading this publication. Philippe Rahm, he's a Swiss architect and principal in the office of Philippe Rahm Architect, based in Paris. His work, which embeds architecture in his environmental and climatic field, has received an international audience in the context of sustainability. His recent work includes the first prize for the Farini and San Cristoforo Urban Master Plans Competition in Milan in 2019, the 70-hectare Central Park in Taichung, Taiwan, completed recently in 2020, the ongoing Agora of the French National Radio in Paris, the new head office building of the company Bureau Valle near to Paris, Paris, and the competition for the new park for the Esplanade of La Défense in France. He has held many professorships at GSD Harvard University, Columbia, Cornell, or Princeton universities. He is also a tenured associate professor at the National Superior School of Architecture in Versailles. His work has been exhibited widely, such as at the Venice, Chicago, or Seoul Architecture Biennales. As well, he has published numerous monographic books and articles, such as, for example, Form Follows Climate, or constructed atmospheres. 
In 2020, he created the exhibition Histoire naturelle de l'architecture at the Pavillon de l'Arsenal in Paris with an accompanying catalog, which we will hopefully also talk about with him today. So I'd like to thank both of you for being here today and please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Claudia and Philip. I think Philip Ram will start or Claudia, I don't know. Uh, Claudia will start, thanks. Thanks, um, thanks Evelyn for the introduction. Um, just a quick question, how do I control the presentation? I was not briefed. Somebody control it for me. Okay, very well. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. So, uh, thanks a lot for the the invite here. Thanks, Areti and uh, Lydia. I think I'm gonna be briefed now. Okay, okay, perfect, perfect. So, um, today I would like to discuss the relationship between design and living, starting from the brick or the bio brick title, synthetic crystal ladon. Uh, which we presented here at the, the sixth um, edition of the Tallinn Architectural Biennale. Uh, this brick engaged, um, the video is not playing, what should I do? Okay. The, um, this brick engaged with the research developed at, the, at Innsbruck University, which map, draw, understand, and make proposal for how the landscape of, uh, and the body of glacier can be transformed. Glaciers are currently disappearing and many of the infrastructure that are devised to retain this form of landscape is related to the covering of this landscape. But can new opportunity emerge? We discovered that glaciers are also populated by microecology, in particular uh, algae nivalis and porphyridium are red algae that grow on glaciers, absorb pollutant, actually contribute to their melting, but become probably or could become a new form of synthetic landscape. These microalgae turn red because of the extreme condition in which they grow on glacier. You saw some of the photos we took on glacier in the short video. And uh, this element, this red called axastantin, is potentially a nutrient for us. So what the project presented here is Plore is a bio brick, a form of synthetic crystallization where this microalgae that grow, let's say, wildly on glacier could be cultivated and at the same time develop a different way of transforming glacier. We are in time of climate change, but change is an inherent quality of the planet we inhabit. Rather than stopping change, can we establish positive dynamic of change? And in this sense, by absorbing some of the pollutant and producing nutrients, in this case, for our skin, for our body, can we devise new form of synthetic landscape? This is an exploration that has been ongoing in the last uh, 10 plus year in my practice, as well as my academic research. We have developed multiple of these bio brick, you can see here uh, the bio bombola, and this is my house and my kids, that's me. In this case, we are cultivating another uh, type of microalga is uh, spirulina. Spirulina is another nutrient, is another food, in this case, not for our skin, but for, it's a protein base, uh, plant protein base um, aliment, and um, it can be harvested weekly at the same time, is able to remetabolize some of the bioproduct of our city. It creates, therefore, a circular um, ecology, and it can nurture us on a daily basis. This old research is part of the Photosynthetica Consortium that uh, uh, has been founded by Mark and myself and integrate uh, multiple partners at the academic level. 
uh, we have developed prototypes that range from the micro scale to the mesoscale to the macro scale of the city. Here you can see a zoom in view of R26L, um, a biodigital 3D print as culture integrated uh, uh, microalgae in bio. A gel format, a sort of a living filter was originally commissioned by the Centre Pompidou in Paris and then exhibited at the Mori Museum uh, in Tokyo, at the MAC Museum in Vienna, in Madrid, and is currently in Hyundai Motor Studio, Busan. Urban well-being. We have developed a prototype of well-being. The one you see here is the Biotecat, our first permanent photosynthetic architecture developed in Astana for the export remain to the city as a museum of biotechnology. Uh, future food, we have worked with different uh, um, companies from the corporate sector in the food industry to develop uh, elements of their factory and their headquarters that are able to, at the same time, absorb some of the byproduct of their production line, but also produce elements that they get integrated in their R&D uh, department. Carbon neutrality, we have developed facade and system that may attempt to transform architecture in a living system, in a living machine, in a photosynthetic organism to, to target the challenge of the carbon neutral city in, in a context in which a uh, city grows continuously, we inhabit a metabolically linear city. Resources are consumed on one end, waste and pollution are emitted on the other. This is the city we inherited from modernity. Can we envision a different city where multiple cycles are designed and interconnected? Cities are still the emitter of 70% of the CO2 in our planet. And in London, a large amount of people still live in small microclimate that, if measured, are well above the level of danger suggested by the WU organization. Can we convert what city expel as waste or pollution into superfood or a new form of material for a growing urban population? This is what we are challenging with the photosynthetic venture. And in particular, one of the core organisms at the center of this venture are microalgae. Microalgae are in itself a consequence of climate change. Here you see a satellite view of the Baltic Sea and the little white dot is a petrol tanker, so it's quite big. <laughs> and uh, algae bloom on many of the sea of our planet because they are able to nurture uh, on some of the byproduct of our city. What we call pollutant, and is dangerous for us as species, is actually food for them. So the idea here is to create uh, alliances with them. As a matter of fact, most of the CO2 that we produce is currently absorbed by our ocean and by the microalgae present on them. So with Photosynthetica, the aim is to create artificial habitat, habitat where algae grow collectively within the city from a wilderness, they become part of a form of synthetic landscape. And beauty and pleasure are part of the question. Can we integrate beauty and efficiently um, photosynthetic organisms in our city in order to remetabolize some of the byproduct and produce biomass and clean air? This is what uh, we started with the photosynthetic facade system, measuring uh, the effect of microalgae that are effectively um, much more um, photosynthetic than larger organisms because all their body is completely devoted to the photosynthesis and to the remetabolization, and therefore, in this sense, for us, more suited for the uh, dense urban context. The, the, the building becomes, in this sense, dynamic. Air enters from the bottom of the photobioreactor and exit um, oxygenated, and the pollutant gets uh, eaten by the algae and become, in this sense, another form of substance. So this is the 
metabolic cycle of photosynthetica, CO2, and other elements from the yeast, CT, NOx, PM2.5, PM10, enter, and we have as output uh, um, data, algal biomass, uh, and uh, oxygen that can feed on different industries on the city and that feed back to the city and the single individual. This type of cycle has been explored in terms of um, absorption of pollutant in many of our installations, and lately we started to investigate what can be done, how this biomass can become a nutrient for us, but even for architecture. Here is a photo taken recently at the Air Lab in London. It's an exhibition, but it's also a workshop. We work from there um, three days a week, and we work in producing uh, biopolymer, both in the form of uh, material sample that you see here, but also in the form of 3D printable uh, filament directly the, from the microalgae that are cultivated in their lab. Now we will see here a short video of the air lab, I think. Ah, oh, no, these are some of the filaments, sorry, got confused, that got produced there. And uh, then we engage with multiple forms of uh, uh, printing through this uh, uh, biopolymer and robotic uh, production. Through the collaboration with Otrevin, we started to imagine a new kind of public realm where the filtration or the purification of air becomes an act of playfulness, an act of interaction with the microclimate that we breathe every day. The Air Lab is um, really a collection of actions or practices. In the Air Lab, we close the loop and explore what we can do with the biomass that we extract uh, from the purification process. the biomass that we transform into biopolymer first, so a biodegradable uh, form of uh, plastic that is entirely made with uh, renewable and degradable um, ingredients. And then we transform these into filaments for 3D printing. This uh, process enables us uh, to optimize the position of this material and create products of uh, self-care that are, again, entirely biodegradable and in this case also carbon neutral. The neti pot is uh, one of these uh, examples that uh, visitors of the Air Lab will also be able to use and practice with. And it materializes this uh, near future dream uh, where people will be able to take care of themselves while taking care of the environment that they are part of. We are often said that we need to stop the uh, ecological disruption that our planet is going through. But if we think about it, uh, change is an inherent quality of planet Earth. Planet Earth change continuously. We cannot stop change, but we can design architecture, devise architectural instrument to establish a different understanding of change, as well as positive dynamic rather than disrupted one. So, through this type of investigation, we explore the re-metabolization and the production of biomass, both as edible organism for us, for our skin, but also as somehow food or material innovation for architecture, as, um, for example, presented here on the tree one. The tree one is currently um, in show at the Yundar Moto Studio in Busan. It's... Um, a form of synthetic tree, uh, 3D printed bio, through biopolymer, which is able to uh, photosynthesize and at the same time, similarly to a natural tree, be able to sink carbon in its uh, materiality, in its uh, biopolymer uh, structure that is uh, being robotically 3D printed and 
presented here. This is part of an investigation on synthetic tree and architectural structure that are able to integrate both alive microalgae than their bioproducts. So they grow from the biomass that they produce and this is a series of the super tree will be in produced different one. This is part of the ZKM uh, collection and um, integrate uh, again uh, living microorganisms. This type of research on a scientific and design level has been feeding on case study and design innovation project that the studio has developed at the mesoscale of architecture, we have been working on the Photosynthetica Tower for the city of Linz, the Photosynthetica Tower morphologically related to OrthoXL, which is both a bioprototype and in this sense a scale model of um, what the bio, uh, Photosynthetica Tower could become. At the larger scale of the architecture, aside from the microcultivation of uh, algae, we uh, the Photosynthetica Tower integrates uh, as well uh, larger garden and uh, passages for migratory birds and as well as hybrid program of inhabitation and uh, uh, scientific development um, in the atrium. To test one of these uh, uh, units we have uh, work on the Biotech Act effectively it's realizing in one to one one of the unit of the photosynthetic tower through multiple program the scientific one there is a science in in, in residence in inside of the uh, Biotech Act that uh, continuously cultivate the microalgae and demonstrate what can be produced through the byproduct of their cultivation in terms of energy, for example, is able to produce 10 kilowatt hour of energy, which is uh, enough to um, support a family of four. Uh, the second space of the biotech art, the art experience, the interaction, invite the user to interact with cultivation, provide the CO2 to the microalgae, as well as interacts with the uh, morphological articulation of uh, the photobioreactor. Uh, this space uh, is able to produce, uh, um, to consume two kilograms of CO2 per day, which is the equivalent of 32 large tree or a uh, small urban forest. And ultimately the garden, where the harvest happen and the biomass uh, is transformed, uh, it produces 600 grams of uh, protein per day, which is... Um, the intake of protein enough for 12 adults and the equivalent protein that um, will be produced by eight cow. But these numbers are not here to justify the presence of the biotech art or other photosynthetic projects, are rather here to describe or its materiality and describe how this number becomes in the biotech art uh, material articulation. There is a move from an architecture as a machine for living to an architecture that aim at being a living machine. This was um, presented this year also in uh, COP, uh, last year in COP26 uh, in Glasgow through the Air Bubble Eco Machine, in which we were um, invited uh, to explore the architecture of carbon neutrality. Being a temporary event, we decided to work with an architecture that is 90% made of air, water, and bacteria. There is a just thin layer of TPU, 0.01. Uh, millimeter so is very thin and uh, when packed is less than 80 kilo and the user are invited to uh, remetabolize the air through pleasure, special pleasure and playfulness as well as uh, um, interaction. So through the interaction the, the air get recirculated and the water in this case is acting also as a ballast and as element that humidified and contribute to the metabolism as well as structural property of the architecture. The air bubble is a part of a, a long term project that we have started with GSK, pharmaceutical company. Uh, they contacted us three years ago and we started to work on a set of playful um, form of architecture for the city. In this case, uh, the first one was the air bubble playground in Varsa. Varsa is one of the most polluted cities in Europe and their aim is, was to try and understand how we can involve kids in transforming the air of the city and how playground could become, the, the air in the playground could be transformed. 
feel stuck in the middle. Do I send them out to play in collusion or keep them locked up inside? It's a major problem. Pollution levels are far worse at the child's height. They are more sensitive to the detrimental effects of air pollution. We all grew up going outside and not having to worry about things. I never thought I'd have to protect my kids from the one thing that keeps them alive. As a mom, it breaks my heart. I just want to play. Microalgae are incredible organisms. And with our technology, we can use them to clean our city's air. We have gone to one of Europe's most polluted areas and built the world's first air purifying biotechnological playground. The uniqueness of this concept relies on the relationship between the architecture and the kids. <laughs> The more children play, the more the algae absorb pollutants and clean oxygen is released. This algae is what's taking the bad stuff out of the air. The air feels amazing. <laughs> the key aspects of this project is to create awareness that uh, it is indeed possible to clean the air we breathe. This can't be the only way to help them breathe better. We need to do more. One of the main challenges in this project was really to discuss with the multiple stakeholders involved how, in this case, it was not a playground with attached a, a nature-based technology, it was the architecture that was contributing to the metabolization of the air and of the um, environment surrounding it. Through its morphology, the relationship between the uh, the the ETFE membrane and, and the roof and the air circulation and as well as the kids playing. These are Giacomo and Lulu, my son and daughter. Um, and uh, this would activate and create a relationship with the microalgae. Um, in this project, we also started to embed a set of sensor and monitor for also research purpose. So we uh, monitor um, the level of pollution across the city uh, of uh, Varsov, um, as well as in the area uh, adjacent and inside of the playground. And we observe a reduction of uh, 75 to 95 percent of PM 2.5 and PM 10, that are the most dangerous particles in the air, as well as of the air quality index uh, by Wu. As you can see, the, the white dot are inside or in the area surrounding the playground, while the gray dot are um, outside. We then uh, um, expanded this, uh, this, uh, this concept to uh, the idea of the biofactory. We started also a series of projects with the food industry here. Uh, you see the um, Lisbon headquarters of uh, Nestlé, where we integrated a uh, um, photosynthetic uh, facade cultivating spirulina, which their R&D group is aiming at integrating in their project. So at the same time, is a benefit for the office space, but it becomes a uh, uh, product uh, as well for their uh, production line and we are currently exploring the expansion of these and how their factory as well could be transformed in larger uh, photosynthetic system um, able to remetabolize some of this pollutant. Um, at the level of the household, this was explored in uh, bit by a bot uh, for the Venice Biennale, the last uh, session of the Venice Biennale, how we will live together and our aim and the aim of bit by a bot was to explore how we live with cyanobacteria. Uh, the environment we created at the three level, the curtain, that is the inoculation of microalgae, is effectively the home of the algae. Um, the, the convivium where the algae are, are then consumed and become 
edible and the, gar and the garden, the vertical garden. The vertical garden is the area where then the, the microalgae after being becoming a filter with the site environment and being grown in the, in the vertical curtain, they become, um, they get cultivated in a more intense manner, harvested and taken care of from the um, household. Uh, inhabitant and then from there they can be harvested and we in this case uh, we this is one of uh, 36 uh, uh, glass 3d printed um, glassware we developed with Swarovski each of them contain uh, uh, biogel with uh, microalgae uh, food drink uh, which we developed with a local chef and um, each of them contain the same amount of protein of a T-bone steak so it becomes edible throughout the, the exhibition itself. Of course, this has got repercussion also at the city level, and with this I will close my conversation just to mention that there are other microorganisms we work with, like the Physarium polycephalon, that in this case become a form for us, a uh, um, co-designer in many projects, and there's been a co-designer in uh, the project we developed for the previous Biennale for the peninsula of Pagliassare, in that case we started to investigate how the algorithmic logic or the computational logic of the Fisarium polycephalo distributedness and collective intelligence could be transposed to the water system of Tallinn, which at the moment is centralized and at the moment of the Biennale was centralized and converging on the peninsula of Pariasare, it how could be distributed so that each household could become transformative and how this redistribution could have an effect on the, on the morphology of the city of Tallinn during the, the um, uh, winter period as well as during the summer period when some of this infrastructure become more photosynthetic for a future blue-green planning. <coughs> we have recently developed further this uh, level of research and uh, developed a machine learning algorithm that has been trained through the intelligence of our Fisarium polycephalum and here we can see um, a project we developed for the Centre Pompidou which is now part of the collection. We see uh, it's, a, it's a computational video here, we have just a few frames um, in which the this Gunfizarium algorithm is um, transforming uh, parting from the scale of the city to the scale of the Pompidou uh, and uh, rethinking it uh, through a uh, blue green planning and distributed uh, um, algorithm. This is one my favorite uh, frame in which the infrastructure or pipes of the Pompidou do get completely rethought by the algorithm in a form of uh, um, organic and digital one. This um, interface uh, um, uh, it allows us also to develop collaboration with the United Nations Development Program in which we have been working in developing countries such as Guatemala City to try and understand how some of their uh, problematic, in this case Guatemala City has got huge problem with waste and the geological infrastructure could be mapped and transformed uh, so that the remetabolization of waste could happen locally through some of the prototype uh, we have seen before. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and uh, to present my work. So it will be a little like a, like a, like a meal uh, with a starter and a main course and dessert because it will be like different uh, type of project. And I have uh, bring um, the, um, some, some research and some project about food that I made uh, since um, uh, since many years, so I'm starting with a kind of historical uh, background. Uh, this is a book uh, I, I made uh, two years ago, Histoire naturelle de l'architecture. It's only in French, and uh, but in this book, it's a kind of history based on climate, epidemic, and energy, and. Uh, there is a few chapters that involve uh, food in the history of architecture. The first 
the second chapter is about the creation of the city and it's quite interesting to understand that the city at the beginning was just a um, granary. You know, it's uh, where you keep the food, where you keep the, the, the grain. Uh, you have to create um, a place where the, the grain will be kept and then you have um, the re religious people that were the a counter to calculate the quantity of grain that each peasant was giving to the to this place and then you have the king and the soldier that was defending the the granary and if you look in the history of architecture, the beginning of the city, the city is reality, the, is the storage of the food and all the people are around that. And, um, and so we can see that at the beginning, you know, in the, in the Babylon uh, period also, if you look to the um, um, Egyptian temple, uh, temple, you know, they are full of uh, storage of grain. And it was the same with monastery and uh, abbey during the Middle Age. You know, it was in reality, it was storage for food. And, um, and this is quite interesting to understand that uh, the, 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 the city in reality is a granary. Uh, then there is another chapter about how beam, beam, uh, beams uh, create uh, Gothic architecture. Uh, it's a link between the energy and the type of architecture. Of course, if you have a lot of energy, you build skyscraper. If you have uh, no energy, you build just a, a small house. And, uh, and this is something that is quite obvious, but we forget sometimes this kind of uh, close relationship between energy and, uh, and the form of architecture. And there is an inter interesting moment in the Middle Age. Uh, it's um, at 1000, there is a big change. Before it was a dark age period and after it was uh, the, the beautiful Middle Age. And there is a big change. It was linked to agriculture. There is a big, before it was like a period of two uh, you know, there is a, one period you cultivate the ground and one period you let the, the ground fertilize it by, them, by itself. And then they introduce uh, three periods. So first it was um, cereal, uh, and then the second per period is, was beans, and then it was uh, empty. And the beans bring protein into the diet of the middle-aged people, and it changed completely, you know, the people become stronger because uh, you need protein for the muscle but also the animals so we we you can find skeleton of uh, horses before uh, 1000 they are very small very uh, and after that they are big, uh, they are bigger and so we can relate the the big change you know because before all the architecture was built in wood and uh, very uh, fragile architecture and after it was in stone and, uh, and the Gothic architecture started there. So there is this kind of connection between the type of diet that the people have and the type of architecture that come from that. Um, then there is also something about iodine, uh, you know, the, in the, at the beginning of the 19th century we, um, uh, we discover iodine in the, um, in the sea uh, water and the Swiss uh, doctor find a relationship between uh, uh, some, um, uh, some uh, disease like water and, and the lack of iodine that was creating the, in, in Switzerland, we were talking about Crétin des Alpes, the crazy people from the mountain, and because they have a lack of iodine. And this uh, moment when they, we discover that iodine was important for the, for the metabolism of the human body, it was a big, big movement from the people to go to the sea. So it was the invention of all the, the city on the, on, the, on the sea, like Brighton, like uh, Deauville, Trouville, and also all the, the movement to the small town like Vichy, Evian, where there is iodine into the water. So the, there is a big urbanization of the territories in, in, uh, through this, uh, because iodine was on the seawater, on, on a different, uh, on, on very precise um, type of uh, water we can find sometime in the mountain. And so it was all this moment where the, the territory was urbanized, looking by people looking for iodine um, at that moment. Uh, so we can say that this is a kind of iodine uh, consequence. Then, 
there is uh, something also um, uh, with the modern architecture. We can say that modern architecture is coming from the uh, dry meat uh, of, um, of the Grison in Switzerland. Uh, there is a, you know, a, a, a at that moment, uh, we, you know, we, uh, Louis Pasteur and Robert Corr, they discovered that the disease was linked to uh, microbe, uh, microbe, but they didn't know how to solve the problem. It was only, uh, you know, the discovery of uh, antibiotic was only in 1950. So, uh, so when you become sick at that time, it was very complicated to survive. And, uh, and so... Uh, in, the, in the Grison in Switzerland, one doctor was um, looking to find solution for, uh, for someone that have uh, tuberculosis and uh, he was thinking about the dry meat of the Grison and he said, us in the mountain, we expose meat, dead meat, to the sun and to the air and uh, to the arm of the mountain, and it's uh, very good, it smells uh, good, it's tasty, and so what's about the living uh, flesh, the living meat? And uh, so he exposed the people to that, and it was a success, it was a, a completely a random success, but in reality it was a success, the guy survived with the tuberculosis, and so it was the beginning of the old the sanatorium, you know, in Davos, the first uh, Schatzhalp sanatorium that was built in the 90, at uh, the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century. And all the architecture from that is coming, uh, all the modern architecture is based on, the, on this discovery, you know, to have a lot of light, uh, to have a, a lot of uh, good air, and to have a big window, to have solarium, to have a whiteness, to increase uh, the lighting. So we can say that uh, the modern architecture is coming from this uh, dry meat uh, experience in, uh, in the Grison. Um, now I will change, it was like the uh, historical background, now I would like to present some uh, project, um, exhibition project I made um, um, based on, the, on food. Um, this one was an exhibition in, uh, at, the, at the Venice Biennale and it was called Digestible Gulf Stream, so it was a link between climate and food. Uh, and. Um, uh, because at that time I was interesting to to understand that the um, the link between arch why we need architecture it's because our body is uh, 37 degrees Celsius we have to keep this temperature so we have to uh, for doing that for keeping this temperature we have to eat uh, food uh, protein or uh, calorie we have to eat things and also if it is not enough uh, you know because uh, the Eat the the meat is producing the the, the temperature the, the energy for the body. But if it is not enough, we need to build a microclimate around the body to keep the 37 degrees Celsius. So it's where I it's why I say architecture is in between uh, food and climate. If we want, it's uh, it's uh, to deal with these two parameters. And so for the Venice Biennale, uh, I, I made this uh, proposal that was creating uh, an architecture based on climate. So, um, you know, by using this kind of uh, software where you can design the movement of the air uh, linked to uh, the hot air is moving up, the cold air is going down. So to create like a space of, uh, of that. And then, uh, so it was like present like that. So it was like a hot, platform and a cool platform creating a wind and so the design of architecture was uh, was only about um, about creating climatic um, design and then if you look to the left you can see that there is some um, some uh, red chili paper and uh, and so it was quite interesting also to see that there is a, this kind of physiological relationship between uh, the food and the temperature perception. For example, if you uh, eat chili pepper, you feel like burning. And, uh, and if you f uh, eat mint, uh, you feel cold, you know. Uh, and um, and it's, um, it was, it's also uh, why, for example, in hot country, um, when you eat a hot plate, plate like a chili, uh, chili uh, um, uh, meal, 
you know, the, the chili in reality activate, contain the capsaicin. I think uh, uh, the capsaicin is a molecule that activate the temperature uh, that uh, the, uh, on the skin. There is some uh, neurological cell that are activated by the capsaicin that give the impression to the skin that the temperature is higher than 44 degrees Celsius. So this take a channel, an ionic channel, go to the brain and inform the brain that you are, you are, it's very hot. So you start to sweat, you know, to evacuate the heat by sweating. And so if in reality the climate is not at 44 degrees Celsius, but only at 30, so the body is activating a lot of cooling effect, what we call thermolysis. So it's uh, the vein, uh, the blood vein have become larger. You have the sweating. You know, so you are, you are cooling the, your body more actively. And uh, so it's why uh, to eat chili help the, the, um, the body to cool. Or you can have the same impression with um, with the mint, uh, you know. But the mint is, is a fake impression. So also the mantle gives the impression to the skin or in the mouth that uh, because it takes the same channel that the temperature, it gives the impression that it's cold, and uh, so it's like a, like a fresh cooling. Uh, like that. So we propose also to have candy, uh, mint candy and uh, chili candy, you know, on this kind of, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, then uh, another uh, exhibition we made in Copenhagen, it was during the COP, uh, one of the um, uh, COP um, in 2009, uh, 2009, and it was to to create a kind of architecture that was only about um, like more physiological or more like a food uh, architecture. So we propose, for example, uh, I can show directly uh, some image of the exhibition. So we have like, okay, like uh, we can see a red chili paper, we have uh, mint, we have uh, protein, uh, we have also uh, uh, fish uh, with vitamin D. We have uh, some different type of light. So it was like to decompose uh, the reality of the space, of the, the architecture relationship into kind of physiological and not to have uh, the envelope, but to keep only the essence of uh, what we are looking for. So we are looking for heat, we are looking for light, for activating or blocking the melatonin or activating the vitamin D uh, uh, synthesis and things like that. So it was this kind of um, uh, decompose uh, uh, architecture that was present in the, in the Royal School of Architecture in uh, Copenhagen at that time. Uh, no, it was a um, small competition we won uh, in Berlin, in Berlin, Berlin for the Kunstwerke. It was like to create a cinema, and we proposed to have these fermented movies. So the idea was to connect the food, the the, um, the heat production, and the um, uh, the protein, and a kind of um, uh, sustainable system of ventilation. Uh, through uh, the cinema. So in reality, we base all the project on the double flow air renewal system. So we have fresh air that arrive, and then uh, this fresh air is heated by the beamer. So it was before the lead beamer, but uh, so the beamer is hot, and then it sends some energy on the screen. And on the screen, we propose to have a milk, milk white screen and that was heated by the projector and then the air move uh, into the, the, the space and then go back and there is a heat exchanger. And um, so we just calculate that, uh, uh, you know, if you are looking for a movie, if you stay motionless during uh, two hours, you know, the, the, the calorie you are losing is, uh, is similar to one yogurt. So we 
have this kind of uh, process between the heat and the production of food and uh, the heat we are losing during uh, by watching the movie and then we can after that we can take again back the that so this was like the the screen during the projection and then uh, after when it's hand and then we take that and we produce some yogurt uh, made by the by the heat produced by the human and by all the energy uh, during the uh, another small project, it was for an exhibition, it was um, um, about the relationship between the different climate in the house and the fact that we have to keep, or before, you know, we, we, we have to keep also the food inside the house. So the link between uh, the different uh, climatic quality, for example, where it's dry and humid, uh, dry and, uh, and uh, hot or uh, cold and humid, you know, it's also different area where you can uh, store different type of food and it was why in the old house you have this different uh, um, humidity um, uh, uh, gradient so in the basement you can keep a certain type of food because it's more humid more cold so it's and then when you move up um, it's become uh, more dry and uh, you can keep uh, the, some other type of, uh, of uh, food uh, there. So, uh, but in, in, in a modern apartment, you don't have this uh, vertical stratification. So it's only vertical, uh, only horizontal. So we propose to have a kind of uh, reverse, to reverse the verticality into uh, horizontality and to have a category between where it's more humid and more dry and with, um, with um, uh, also the ventilation, you know, we, where we introduce dry and new air and it move in the house and it's become more humid and then it's go out. So we propose to place all the different uh, function of the house, like uh, where it's more humid, like the shower, but it's also where you keep uh, the apple, uh, and where it's more dry, you keep the rice, and also it's where you are uh, sleeping. And so the, there is a kind of uh, um, humidity, humidity plan of the, of the house, and then it produces this kind of uh, uh, atmosphere of the kind of contemporary apartment that introduce the, the food inside. Then uh, for the dessert, for uh, I will present two projects uh, built in um, recently in Taiwan. Uh, one is a split time cafe, so it's uh, two two food project, but it's more like the program is is a food is a, it's cafe. Uh, this project we first um, did a uh, long time ago, we, we did this project, it was not built there, and we find the possibility to have this in Taiwan. Um, but it was based also on, on this kind of physiological understanding of, uh, of the relation between the body and the architecture and the space. And uh, uh, I work a lot about the relationship between light and the body because when I was student, you know, it was a time where we talk about, about light only in the term of, uh, of uh, metaphysic. It was like the light was something a little like spiritualist. It was a time of Tadao Ando and the people were, were very fascinated by the light, like an abstract uh, quality. But in reality, the light is not only abstract, it's also physiological, you know, you need light uh, uh, for the melatonin. Uh, so there is a kind of uh, surviving uh, body relationship with the light. So we were very interested into this kind of um, uh, physical and uh, metabolism uh, uh, quality of the, of the light. And this is a research that showed that the the quantity of melatonin, melatonin is a hormone, you need melatonin for sleeping and you have no melatonin during the day. But we can see, it was a discovery of 1980 by Alfred Lewy, he showed that if you place a lot of light on the eyes, it blocks the melatonin. And if you turn off the light, you have the melatonin that uh, start to, to be uh, secreted uh, again. So, um, 
So this was this, uh, and the link between melatonin and um, and uh, and the body goes through the the eyes and the pineal gland, and then. Uh, Recently, if it was in 1990 uh, and 2000, you know, they, they start to do research to know which wavelengths block the melatonin or not. And they discovered that it was in the blue that they, it blocked the melatonin. It's, and in the yellow, it doesn't block the melatonin. So it's why, you know, on the, on the smartphone today, you can uh, have a program that block the blue light during the night, you know, to be not aw awake by the light coming from the screen. So, but uh, it, it came from this type of research. And, um, and so we can see that this light, the blue light, blocked the melatonin, so it's like a day, um, a day uh, a space, and this one let the melatonin sec secreted. Uh, so from that we say, okay, if we are a designer, we can design space, but we can also design time. We can really, it's not a metaphor, we can design a day, a kind of perpetual day, by having only blue light, and we can design also a perpetual night by uh, creating a yellow uh, space. And so we propose to have a kind of cafe that was made of, of creating time so you can move from night to day or to, uh, to, to, to natural movement transformation. And so we have these three uh, space that where, uh, you know, you can uh, go in a more uh, night condition and a more a day condition or more turning uh, natural cycle condition. Uh, so it was a project we made at that time and then uh, we have the possibility in Taiwan to, uh, to do that. So it's a small cafe um, and uh, so we can see the three cell, you know, the, the, the kind of perpetual night so, uh, and the day. So you can move, you can decide to go where you want. And so this is a project uh, built. And so it was during, uh, after the construction. And now it's uh, becoming a real cafe in Taiwan uh, where you can have the... Um, you can have some different type of, uh, of food. So this is some Instagram uh, photo. Another project, we, we, we work a lot about the question of convection. And uh, so it was also related to the, uh, to the Venice Biennale when I showed this kind of uh, uh, to, how to design with climate immediately, you know, not, uh, not to design form and geometry uh, and then to ask to the, to the engineer to introduce radiator and ventilation, but to say as an architect, you can also design uh, the, the, the movement of air, the, the comportment of the heat. And, um, and so we know that, you know, the hot air is moving up and the cold air is going down. So um, in the, we, we made a, a, a proposal. It was for um, a kind of study for a new school of art in uh, France. And uh, so we work on this project. It was like a prototype. And, um, and so it was to how oh, to design an atelier uh, for the for the uh, for the um, for the artist uh, for the student, and we don't know if the atelier should be completely black, dark, or with a lot of light, or only north light, or uh, with a high quantity of light. Uh, because maybe if you are doing some video, you need black, uh, dark uh, space. If you are a painter, you need a uh, homogeneous north light. If you are, uh, so yeah, yeah, if you are, uh, if you, if you are working on watches, you, you need a lot of light. So is there is different type of quality of, of light and we don't know what type of art will be produced. So in this project, we propose to have a variety, a, a gradation of lighting, uh, and everybody are free to go where they want. And then we did the same for the heat. Uh, we say, um, if you are a sculptor, 
you, you need a low temperature because you are using your muscle, so it's like a sport hall. You know, the sport hall should be have to be uh, warm only at 14 degrees Celsius because you are producing your own heat. So if it is warm at 20 degrees Celsius, you overheat. It's, it's too hot. So uh, so depending on the type of activity, you need more or less um, temperature. And here we propose to have different type of temperature based on the natural convection. Hot air is moving up, cold air is going down. So this is a section at the top of the drawing. This is a plan. And, um, and so, so at the end, we have this uh, kind of, uh, um, we have four different type of light, four different type of temperature, and it uh, creates 16 different, uh, uh, different space. And so you can have a dark, uh, hot space or a dark, uh, cold space. So, uh, and uh, all the artists can decide where he want to go. And maybe we discover a type of art linked to this kind of uh, uh, condition. Um, so this was like this uh, project um, we made in... Uh, uh, in uh, <clears throat> in north, so you can see that more it go down, more it's cold. More it go up, more it's warm because naturally the hot air is moving uh, up. And uh, and from that we did it in uh, Taiwan for a cafe. Um, so this is the, we take. We, it's three different uh, space uh, with different type of light. So more light uh, it's going from from very uh, bright to very dark and in the section um, we have um, it's go from very cold uh, down to very hot we have the section here and uh, and it work with um, in reality we we have some uh, open space so it's only the the air ventilation the natural ventilation at the beginning and then on the core of the building, we have air conditioning and the cold air of air conditioning is going down. So if you are too hot, you can go down in the underground you can, where it's becoming colder. And uh, so you have different type of, um, of altitude in the cafe and you can decide by yourself where you want to go if you are looking for cold uh, area or more warm. And also depending on the moment of the day, if it is noon, maybe you go down. If it is 6 p.m., you go up. And uh, so we have this uh, cafe here. Uh, there. So uh, thank you very much. Um, So thank you very much, Philippe Ram and Claudio Pasquero, for your insights into your work. I think somehow your work is very different from each other, but on the other hand, you also share like common ground. You both somehow seem to challenge or even question like a whole range of binary relations in architecture, such as this, the distinction between the exterior and the interior, or the uh, public and the private, or the human and the machine. Could a little bit expand on that? Maybe you start, Philip. Um, uh, yeah, yes, I think. I think. Um, I think may maybe we are we are also coming from a moment where the technology was there, and um, it was also uh, so. Um, me, I, I was never afraid, afraid about technique and technology, and uh, so it's why in, in um, my project, you know, I, I, I was I am working in the same way, you know, what is natural or technique, and uh, without uh, because the human is always surviving because uh, of the technique, and we cannot uh, survive. But what I understand also from the experience in, in Taiwan that. You know, the technique is complicated in reality because you need maintenance, you need uh, uh, explanation, you need... Uh, so 
um, so sometimes it's, it, it's uh, you know, because it, for example, in this building, it's full of technique, uh, but, um, but sometimes it's complicated, you know, and uh, so today I'm looking more for more simple solution, you know, more uh, uh, passive solution, because I understand, it's not because I don't trust uh, technique or technology, it's just because it's complicated and, uh, and there is some other issue of uh, maintenance and uh, that are completely, com com that are becoming uh, too complicated for, with the technique. What's your take on that, Claudia? I don't know if you missed the beginning. I, I asked you both um, to what extent uh, do you question this kind of binary relations in architecture between the interior and the exterior, public and private, and how hard is it to have a complete new approach that kind of question also the defining qualities of architecture, such as like permanence or hardness, or also kind of let's say, a resistance to change and uh, movement? Well, in terms of um, uh, interior and exterior, um, I often reflect uh, on the um, um, discipline of architecture, or the word architecture, when it came about. Um, we were in the Renaissance in Florence, the first time we used the word architecture. And I don't know, in, in my opinion, if you think about it, at the time, the relationship between what I like to call the biosphere and the urban sphere, but you could say uh, the human and the environment, uh, was kind of opposite to the one we have now. Uh, there was wilderness, both in terms of natural as well as artificial system. And somehow, in that sense, maybe um, the perspective view as a technique and the wall or the fortress as a way of uh, sheltering um, at the meaning in terms of architectural system. But in a moment in which our urban sphere, our city, the network that sustain our city is so strong and the biosphere is much weaker, maybe architecture could be Become something more uh, soft, wet, tangible, and also a, a, an interface that is not anymore about creating a fortress, but actually enabling a dialogue. An, a dialogue that allows us to maybe go create deeper conversation with the environment of our planet, with non human species. And in that sense, it's true. It depends on if technology can become a technique or a daily practice. The question is that uh, sometimes when we integrate technology, it depends how you see them, how you witness them. Um, there are technologies that are designed. Design has an incredible role in there. They are designed, in, in my opinion, a way to be close. We can't interact with them. There is no pleasure, there is no aesthetic, there is no spatial articulation, there is no daily practice. But what if uh, we, we have the possibility nowadays to integrate uh, um, biological material, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, microorganisms in a way that maybe is more sophisticated, but more simple. <laughs> in a way that we can create material languages and interact. That, the complication, in my opinion, is not on a technological level there, but is more on a societal level. We are used to purchase, consume, and dispose. That's what we see around us. That's what we are told most of the time, not only verbally, but even by the way architecture is designed, the space where we live are designed. So can we de define a different narrative also through architecture, whereas we don't purchase, consume, and dispose, but we transform. That's, for me, it's where architecture can play a role, and that's my interest and where I work through, although I'm not sure that political or at the moment we are going in that direction. That brings me right to my next question. So how challenging is it to introduce this kind of new thinking in this kind of static discipline? I mean, I know that you kind of disseminate your projects a lot within the context of biennales or academic context, but you surely also work with like real investors, the real world. 
could a little bit tell us about your experiences with that, maybe Philip? Um, currently, we are working um, uh, with uh, for uh, industrial building with our office building, and uh, and so um, we propose to you know because you we have uh, we need some space for production and space for office, and then um, we start to um, to combine the question of um, of public space uh, you know because you, you there is some public space like the cafeteria or the stairs where the people meet and uh, and uh, all the this kind of uh, sharing uh, space of the of the production and then um, I have proposed for that to uh, not to, to 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 say that the public space is only a social social space definition, but it's also a climatic space definition. Because if you look in the past, the social social uh, space, the public space was also was always linked with a climatic quality. For example, the the. Um, uh, if you in Switzerland, there is a you know on the pl place there is a trees, and you go under the trees because there is a shadow, and the shadow of the trees was creating a public space, or the um, the fountain was creating a public space, or the basilic, uh, you know, it was a shadow built for in the Roman uh, city, it was creating a, a shadow. And it was a public space. And also the church, uh, you can say, the church was a big air conditioning building in Rome, uh, in Italy, you know, where it's too hot. You can, uh, you can go in the church and, and cool yourself. Uh, so there is a, this kind of uh, between climatic uh, quality and public space. So for, for this project, for the uh, industrial project, we propose to have a, a greenhouse and a grotto uh, to say, okay, the greenhouse will be um, will will be produce um, hot air during the winter, and also be the public space of the building, and all the the the, the hot air produced there will be introduced uh, in the building. And then during the summer we have the grotto. So in the history of architecture you can find a lot of grotto. Uh, you know there is a in France a very beautiful lettre of Marie Antoinette. Uh, milk house for Marie Antoinette is like kind of built grotto, you know, where how to create coolness without electricity or create a kind of natural fridge. Um, so we are building a natural fridge and a nat natural heater, like uh, that two pole where in between the the the, the building, the, the 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 industrial space and the uh, the uh, will be there. So. Um, so I can introduce, you know, uh, this kind of idea of climatic ID by combining all the different demand. And uh, of course, today it's uh, becoming so um, obvious, you know, with the energy crisis, uh, we need to to think about that and uh, uh, to find uh, natural and uh, cheap uh, solution for cooling or for warming. So I think it's why a little I the you know, our research are, I, I think we are a little sensible to what's happened. You know, maybe we are sometimes more sensible than the other at the beginning. We feel something. And uh, so I, I think Claudia also with this idea of CO2 and the, the alga, and, and they are working since many years on these things. And we are working also on this climatic issue since many years because we are understanding that something is turning, something is changing, and the, and the world is going in this direction. So it's, uh, it's why today it's more simple for me to explain what is the role of climate you know, in the architecture, because and everybody understands that, okay, you have to, to reduce the CO2 emissions, so all this question of, uh, of um, thermal insulation, uh, air renewal, are, are completely necessary and also today and maybe it's since the summer because it was too hot there is this heat wave so everybody are understanding that climate that architecture has to do something with climate you know we have to provide cool cold space we are to pro and and in the f in next winter we have to provide warm space because we are to turn off the radiator because it's too expensive so all to all architecture can provide for free 
uh, warm space. So this is a, this kind of uh, of mission are becoming uh, very uh, evident, I think, today. I very much like the topic between the relation of the public space and the climate space. Maybe we can discuss it later on. But Claudia, what's your take on that question that um, how hard it is to introduce this kind of new thinking in, in the discipline of, of architecture? Well, following up on what uh, Filippo was saying, I think one of the main issues is uh, really an issue of integration rather than segregation. As I was mentioning during the presentation, when we designed the playground, one of the greatest obstacles we had was to articulate the playground as an integrated space that was able to remetabolize the air and not as an architecture to which we were applying a machine or a tested uh, uh, technology. And this is present also methodologically. I think one um, element that uh, somehow I think was correlated in both presentations is the way scientific knowledge and design knowledge or visual languages are interwoven and you cannot pick them apart. Uh, in biological system, um, uh, aesthetic uh, and, and beauty is a measure of ecological intelligence and we come from 200 years that are a little bit too dominated by positivistic thinking in my opinion in which these two realms seems to be two different disciplines they're just reading of reality that you cannot separate and the same effort for example Philippe was mentioning the public space and you know we define spaces uh, targeted and oriented and specialized but um, I would like to make a short uh, uh, life example that many of my colleagues know already. I, I come from a family of wine producer, and when I was a kid, the, the wine production in the north of Italy um, was uh, still integrating spatial articulation with uh, pleasure, uh, with uh, aesthetic, uh, as well as with production. The, the whole system was interwoven. In the moment uh, you had the cutting of the grapes, you also had the fair in the village, you will meet in the square in front of the church, the ch the side where you go to cut the grapes on that day. At four, uh, the mother of the house will cook, <laughs> and then we will um, smash the, the grapes, and we will get the juice, and then all the process comes about. It was, it was a party. Right, and it was uh, clearly articulated. It had a precise aesthetic, but was interweaving with productivity, public space, economy, politics, and a lot of other elements. You could then pick the, these apart. And I'm not really aiming to go back there because you never go back. But uh, what I think we can take from pre-industrial society is this uh, complexity, this. Uh, um, this not feeling the need to specialize that I think we inherited from the first industrial revolution and maybe now we can rephrase or it's time to rephrase and articulate the difference, but this is an obstacle. We, we, we come from a few hundred years in which this idea of specialization, segregation, uh, you are a scientist or you are an architect or you are an artist, uh, it's a cultural framework we have created <laughs> and that at the moment I think is impeding us to really deal with ecological issues that are much more uh, complex, interwoven and need probably to be defined with multiple languages that uh, are not so s simply separated. I'm glad that you just said that we, you never go back or we ne never go back, but I do have the notion that you somehow look at vernacular architecture or also historic architecture to gain more knowledge or to, to kind of overcome the segregation that was made by modernism. Could you comment on that, Philip? What is uh, your relation with, or also in the, this exhibition, Histoire naturelle de l'architecture, you bring a lot of examples from like uh, ancient times. Yeah, um, I think one, one, uh, one uh, uh, conversation is about the question of the autonomy of, uh, of architecture. When I was a student, you know, we, we heard a lot about this idea of autonomy of architecture, of the discipline. We are, we are architects and so we are living in the field of uh, the discipline and uh, 
And then I still sometimes heard, for, if you are talking, about, for maybe it's changed now, but uh, two years ago, if you are talking about climate, some people say it's not ar about it's not architecture you know it's something uh, something else it was the same with computer it's not you know a computer was not uh, architecture so there is this kind of idea of autonomy that it's uh, the field of architecture is only architecture and it came from Aldo Rossi from the 1960 and then I, I start to understand from where, where from where it's coming this idea and then I understand that it's come from Claude Levi Strauss from the structuralism because the structuralist is to, to, and to say, okay, we are not looking for the cause of things, we are just looking for, not about what happened in the infrastructure, of the material infrastructure, we are just looking what happened in the superstructure. In the, in the, in, and so when you are reading Claude Lévi-Strauss, for example, he is talking about architecture, but only in terms of, uh, there is a, the bachelor or the married or people that are there, and, and all the village is organized with that, but he never talk about rain, about heat, about sun, about flood. You know, it's only about a kind of uh, superstructural and, and there is no more material, uh, climatic reason for explaining things. And uh, for Aldo Rossi and all this generation, it was like that. And, and so it's why they didn't understand that in reality architecture was completely based on climatic issue you know if you are looking the, to the the you know I, I, in my book i, I talk about the, the the villa rotonda from palladio it's a climatic machine you know you have uh, four sides because one is for the summer one is for the winter for the morning and for the afternoon so it's why it's uh, it's designed like that and uh, you have a dome to evacuate the hot air in the middle uh, so the high ceiling is to because it's cold, cooler if you have high ceiling than uh, low ceiling. So everything is based on climate. But I never learned that when I was a student. You know, we completely, completely lost the reason of things during uh, 50 years. And why? Because we were completely doped by uh, carbon energy, you know, and antibiotic by oil and antibiotic give us the power to imagine that there is no more infrastructure, we are only living in the superstructure, we are only talking about culture, about symbols, about metaphor, about analogy, and we completely forget that the things was based on the material. And now it's, you know, we have an epidemic two years ago, we have the global warming, we have the energy crisis, so we are rediscovering that everything is based on uh, infrastructure. So I think it's, um, it's, it's really good also for the architecture because we will stop this uh, crazy moment of the autonomy of uh, the discipline that was like, uh, uh, it was funny uh, during uh, 50 years, but it was a kind of dream because it was completely uh, disconnected uh, from the huge amount of energy we, are, we were burning, you know, to, to talk on, only about symbol, you know, because uh, it was behind, it was the coal and the fossil energy that was supporting all these kind of uh, of um, um, metaphor and, and superstructural idea. What about you, Claudia? You, as an Italian architect, do you agree with that, that uh, Villa Rotonda is basically a, a climatic machine? I like the definition, yes. Um, well, my, my comment on vernacular architecture, I guess, uh, was before, is much more my personal relationship with the farm where I, where I grew up. And uh, when I said that we don't go back, is that um, uh, things keep changing all the time and we deal with change. But of course, we can um, recover model from... As I said, my main interest is to recover model from pre-industrial society, whereas there was the possibility to integrate uh, flow of production of uh, climate and uh, in material organization and, and space. In the few minutes remaining, I would like to talk about teaching. You are both involved in teaching and in the training of future architects. How do you think we could adapt uh, like architectural education to better equip the profession to confront the climate crisis? And what do you pursue in, in your own teaching? Maybe Philip? 
Um, personally, I, I think um, uh, the, te the approach about climate was very uh, low, but not so, you know, uh, um, so because um, the architect were, were they were teaching other things, you know, and uh, but today it changed completely. Also, the, this it came from the student. You know, I, I just have a meeting two days ago for Versailles. And the students, they are complaining because they are not receiving information about climatic issue. And, and so the, 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 in the third year, you know, they are talking about structure, but now they need to talk about the weight of the structure, you know, the CO2 footprint of the structure. So they have to, they continue to work on the structure, on the, like a kind of a vi visible architecture, uh, um, uh, tradition, but by but uh, uh, involving CO2 footprint, you know, uh, because uh, the, the the so I think it's changing, uh, it's changing, but only from one year ago, you know, it's it's uh, so sometimes it's you know I, I'm answering to some newspaper or some journalist, you know, and everybody thinks that the architects they are only working on climate and things. But if they know the reality of what's happened in the school, that nobody uh, care about that, you know, uh, with the, everybody were completely afraid about the reality of, of our formation. So, but it changed now, you know. What's your take on the education of architecture? Well, uh, um, my hope is that uh, architecture and uh, visual language could really have a role in rediscussing climate change, and this is something that uh, can start from from education. And um, there are still um, students that come with the expectation that the landscape is separated from the architecture, and but uh, there is a wider knowledge that develops, and there will be the need to create a discourse uh, to be able to rearticulate. The, the planet in some way, eventually reaching politicians as well. Thank you so much, Claudia and Philip, for being here today.